Hi everyone, happy Friday. If you are in Toronto uh, and are looking out your window, it's absolutely beautiful and sunny. And I think we all need that after this crazy intense week. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, welcome. Uh, this is a series uh, hosted by Game Changer Sessions that we started right around the pandemic. And it's focused on the future of learning. And what we wanted to do was bring together thought leaders, experts, entrepreneurs, next-gen creators, investors, who are all really, really passionate about and involved in where the future of learning is headed. And in this series, we've had amazing guests. We've had Jerry Colonna from Reboot. We've had David Perel, who's uh, got an amazing uh, live uh, writing school. We've had Seth Godin. We've had Shane Parrish, Matt Window from Lambda School, uh, Naveed Nasu from the Knowledge Society. And uh, just earlier this week, we had Salim Ismail uh, from EXO. And these are all people who have very, very interesting views on what's happening. And this series is in partnership with a new live learning platform that we're building to really help cohort-based live learning experiences happen more seamlessly, Mastermind. And so it's with such pleasure and a great honor that I introduce today's guest. Uh, today's guest is Rebecca Caden. Rebecca is a managing partner at one of my favorite firms, Union Square Ventures. Rebecca um, is very passionate personally about the future of learning, which we'll definitely get into. And as a firm, USB is a thesis driven firm that uh, has a really interesting thesis on where uh, education and learning is headed. They've made some incredible investments in the space and we'll get into all of that momentarily. So um, thank you everyone for joining. Welcome Rebecca. How are you doing today? Good, thank you so much for having me. It's so great. Uh, it's so great to see you. I think last time I saw you, we were in a much different place and that was time. Great. Uh, <laughs> that was a totally different world than today, but uh, yeah. fun to see you in both of those. Totally. Um, well, what a week. I know it is like Friday afternoon of most probably the most historic week, uh, you know, right. in our lifetimes. And at least we are breathing, smiling, you know, yep. optimistically <laughs> hoping. Um, so anyway, thank you. I know you've had a long week, but we're so excited to have you with us. Yeah. And I thought, you know, let's, um, let's start. Um, you have such an interesting thesis at Union Square Ventures. And one of the things um, that you talk about is just how little has changed in the past 50 years in education. Yep. And, you know, maybe you can talk a bit about that. You know, what have been your observations? Yeah, you know, I think um, our thesis in education really hinges on, on the idea that technology has fundamentally transformed almost all of the ways we live. If you think about, mm -hmm everything from how we get around, how we work, um, how we, you know, where we live, how we vacation, how we travel, how we communicate to each other and certainly connect. All of that has been really fundamentally transformed by technology. And yet, uh, when you look at kind of the basis of education um, from beginning to end today versus 50 years ago and probably even 100 years ago, um, very little has changed substantively. Technology is used mm -hmm. in the classroom, it's helped on kind of the margins, but it, the structural nature of the education system really has not changed very much. And yet, um, satisfaction rates are going down, um, student debt is you know exponentially increasing, and outcomes have really suffered. Um, people are paying a lot of money to get through schooling um, and yet uh, feeling like they're not prepared for their workforce or that what they really wanted to achieve wasn't happening. And so when we sure. see that, we see something's gonna break, right? Something's gonna change and technology should be a great lever in education just as it's been in so many other sectors to broaden access, to drive up accessibility mm -hmm. and down interesting ways. And that's really formed kind of the basis of the investment thesis that we've operated on. For sure, and I, I'm a big believer in that. Um, obviously, 
uh, with Wattpad being a Union Square Ventures investment as well, you know, not quite an education, but sort of on the borderline of that um, and that mm -hmm. broadening access. Um, what I'm interested in is actually you have a very personal connection to education. And what actually prompted me to reach out to you for the series was actually less about uh, Union Square Ventures and more about this beautifully penned article that your, your late father wrote uh, in the New York Times. And, you know, oh, yeah. it was so interesting. It was it was called Equalizing Education in Ju New Jersey by Lewis B. Caden, 1976. You know, he was yeah. thinking about this. Tell, tell um, our community more, you know, what was this about? What did he write about? Um, why does yeah. education yeah. matter? Yeah. Um, my dad was a fascinating person who lived a very kind of varied career across government and education and business in all kinds of ways. And he um, wrote this article and worked on this case in New Jersey um, when he was exactly the same age as I am. And I didn't wow. find, I didn't discover it until he passed away earlier this summer. And as you do in these things, you, you know, you Google and you try to kind of put pieces together and I came across this article, which really fascinated me because, you know, what I did know is he had been working um, with the New Jersey government um, for the government, for the governor there. And he, he was lifelong passionate around providing access and creating, um, equalizing democracy. And in education in New Jersey, the case was really about that the dollar amount given, you know, allocated for each student's education should not depend on the district that they live in, because it wildly favored certain economic areas over others and how the state could redistribute um, basically redistribute access and wealth in education. And the case had a very bumpy past of, you know, getting caught up in, in courts of all kinds. But at heart, it was about the same idea that we are tackling at USV from a technology angle and a venture angle, which is how do you broaden access to education? How do you create mm -hmm. systems and opportunities that are not based on you know, the wealth you come in with or where you live, but instead on personal passion and drive. Um, and it's, it's fun to think about getting at that through different lenses, both my dad's and, and my own. For sure. I mean, I, I honestly get goosebumps when I read it. And, and we read that, you know, today when we're looking at the U.S. Sure. and we're looking at the impact of, you know, privilege and education and the lack of distribution and, you know, the fact that that is before I was born, you know, this was being written and uh, yeah. and seeing sort of the impact of it not having really changed all that much. Like your point is so on point, which is literally just under 50 years ago, this was written and yet you know, yep. uh, so little has has changed. Um, just a really eerie and interesting comment from this article. Um, it says, you know, in 1970, Kenneth Robinson, seven years old, living in Jersey City, petitioned the courts to, you know, give him an equal education. And I had to look at that twice because I think it's by sheer coincidence, Sir Ken Robinson, which is the same yeah, name yeah. of this New Jersey boy. <laughs> um, you know, I was like, is this the Sir Ken Robinson? It's actually not, but no, no. did you notice but, that? You know, <laughs> where you know, nonfiction can be as poetic as, poetic as fiction kind of moment, because that's, that's true. It's just- Exactly. Um, well, I love that. And, and it's very clear to me that you're very passionate about this. And so let's go like a little bit deeper into the USB thesis. I mean, this yeah. has been a 10 year thesis. It's not new, right? You guys made investments, you know, over the last decade. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'm really interested. Yeah. I'm interested in how it's evolved, right? Like what was it then? And now what is it today? Yeah, I think the most interesting thing about today's moment in time, right, is that there's a lot of attention being given to this thesis, largely because of COVID. And, and you know, COVID has more, much more darkness than, than lightness. But if, if we can find any silver lining around necessary behavior change that can amplify or accelerate structural change, education may be one place that happens. So there's a lot of attention and eyeballs on it today. But yes, it's it's been something USV has been focused on for a long time. You know, I joined the firm 
a little over three years ago, but my partners have been on this for for way longer than that, you know, three times as long. Um, and one thing I love about USV is actually each of the partners has an at least one investment in education. This is a very much a shared passion and goal mm -hmm. that um, we think venture scale venture scale technology can really help this problem. So. The, the thesis started and has evolved and it has evolved around the same idea, which is that you're going to change the system from the outside in so that we're not mm -hmm. interested in going through school districts, going through school systems, selling through channels. We think that products and platforms that go direct to the learner, that build mm -hmm. experiences that they love, that they enjoy, that they learn from, that are outcomes versus credential based will create that kind of momentum and passion that can change a system versus selling into things and kind of going that clunky route. I think what's changed over time or evolved is probably a better word than changes. We started with investments in things like Duolingo, which is mm -hmm. a language learning, lifelong language learning app, a really, you know, was a very small company when USB led it, is now a very big multi, multi-billion dollar company, um, reaches millions of customers. This idea of productized learning to drive down costs throughout someone's life. Um, the, you know, some of the earlier investments also included Skillshare, lifelong learning in a marketplace format that allows this accessibility on being able to learn different things throughout your life. Um, Quizlet. Quizlet is a marketplace approach to um, study guides and aids to really help students in a cost accessible way achieve and help each other in this kind of marketplace model. Examples like this. Um, as it's gone on, we've gotten closer and closer to going at the heart of the problem, which is the school itself, right? And, and we think right. both are interesting, everything from K-12 through lifelong and everything from core education to supplemental, but the meatiest thing may be core, right? Um, versus supplemental. And so maybe a, two years ago, we invested in a business called OutSchool, which is live mm -hmm. online learning. Um, another marketplace model, a very interesting company because it empowers both students and families and also teachers. Teachers are able to offer classes on this platform directly to families and students and you know see really meaningful income when they, gain speed that you know makes them really powerful in that ecosystem and students at a very accessible price are allowed to follow interests in new ways learn about things that may not be offered in their school district or available in their area you know and and they make it really fun spanish through taylor swift songs and calculus through dungeons and dragons and also french one you know and so there's kind of this variety and something for everyone and so that was kind of a little bit closer and then most recently um we invested in a quite early seed company called sora schools and sora schools yeah. is an online high school a network totally. approach school and so you can see us kind of narrowing the filter closer and closer to kind of going straight at can a technology approach really change fundamental education so so interesting and i'd love to go deeper in both of these because i think you hit a couple key points you know that certainly i believe and and sort of we're we believe at mastermind as well which is um this shift towards live learning you know, as a, as a fundamental shift of like the difference yes. between 10 years ago, pre-recorded, you know, digital experiences versus live learning. And I wonder if you can talk to that, you know, is that a big part of your thesis? And, you know, what, what do you think about Zoom as the, you know, platform that all of that's going to happen on versus a more broad um, opportunity beyond Zoom? I think live online learning is super interesting. I mean, one, because we've definitely seen through businesses like OutSchool the, the momentum in them. I think the appeal of a business like OutSchool that offers synchronous learning um, is it accomplishes multiple things. For parents, it accomplishes um, time, right? So yeah. some of what parents do are try to find things to do with their kids' time and totally. a live class one of them. Um, that's just a fact of reality. It also accomplishes um, experiential learning, learning together. Mm -hmm. So learning is content, but it's also experience. And it kind of meets those things in the middle, whereas 
um, some of online learning has only met one or the other. And so we've been interested in the intersection of both. And, you know, I think live online does that. It also provides community for kids. I mean, there are really interesting um, stories about OutSchool during the pandemic. And one of them that I love is I was actually talking to a friend of mine who had a, I think an 11 year old son. And he was saying, you know, he signed him up for this creative writing out school class while his school was was um, remote. And his son had really been struggling through COVID. He had experienced a lot of anxiety. And this class wound up being, I think 10 children around his age from around the, com the country. And they wound up writing a lot of creative essays about COVID and sharing them with mm. each other and talking about them in this class. And he said, you know, more than any other strategy they tried, that method of community of kids that his son could talk to and come together with around the country going through something similar through this education experience was the most helpful thing he did. And I just thought that was so interesting and powerful because it's completely a side effect of a learning platform. It wasn't, you know, that's not out school's mission. The intention. But it, yeah. Yeah. It's a really interesting side effect. And so all of that, you know, you can't develop the same kind of community feel to learning without the live online. So I think there's a big part of it um, that it's helpful. I just don't, I don't think it's the only way. I think what's exciting about this era of learning is it can combine lots of different strategies. Um, you mm -hmm. know, something that we say about Sora, you know, we wrote about in the last investment we did is that, you know, one of the issues with school is that it, you know, pu public school in America works for a lot of kids. It's, it's a really good system, right? Like it's been honed over many years and passionate people work on it and we don't wanna discredit that it's a good system. It just doesn't work for all kids. And so it leaves a big chunk of people saying, you know, I'm not made for school when the reality is that school wasn't made for them and isn't shouldn't right. be the only option for them. And, you know, offering variety both in what the school is and also the modality. Is it live? Is it asynchronous? Is it group? Is it one-to-one? -one? Is it a lot of pieces put together so everyone's learning journey may look a little bit different depending on who they are is something that these technology companies can provide. So I think live online is one modality. I don't think it's the only one. You know, Zoom as an underlying technology I think has been great. It's it's allowed companies to jump a curve that would totally. be very good for themselves. It also won't be the only one, but I think it's been totally. a very useful tool. Yeah, I love what you're saying, because I think, um, you know, school isn't designed for them versus you're not designed for school is a, is a super important thesis, right? That there's going to be so many different kinds of experiences. Um, and the other point that certainly, you know, I believe and, and sort of what we've witnessed is this notion of community, especially when you're socially isolated, you know, the, totally. the, the priority, the importance of that is like 10x what, you know, we even thought it would need to be, right? And that's the same right. for like remote work. Um, and so, you know, live learning, cohort-based live learning experiences, um, that's kind of the, a really interesting thing that feels like very uh, new and relevant. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Mean, clear, like, one thing we're, we want to be very clear we're not saying is that we don't think schools are important. We think schools are wildly important. Yeah. And one reason they are important is because childcare is essential. And yeah. schools do more than that, but that is a significant part of it. And childcare has to do with a place parents can send their kids for the day, but it also has to do with kids being around other kids and learning the interactions of social life. Yeah. And so that can be expressed in different ways, but is an important thing to consider about education. Yeah, I, I know personally, I have two young kids and my yeah. one son was fine live learning, you know. My other son was like, I hate my life. It sucks to be home. I just want to be totally. social in person with my friends. So I, I totally hear that. Um, yeah. There was something you said around, I know you just did the Series B for out school. So you're, you're betting, you're, you know, big on this platform. And it's so yeah. incredible to see the traction. And maybe you can even share some of the, you know, the recent stats. One thing I was really interested in was this idea of habit breaking that the pandemics caused and the, the fact that, you know, the whole system is now much more open to change and especially parents. And maybe you can share a bit more of what you what you 
how out school has fared um, pre and post pandemic. Yeah, look, OutSchool, like many others, both in our education portfolio and out of our education portfolio, have seen massive tailwind growth from the COVID pandemic, right? And, um, you know, 10 to 30x growth on, depending on the platform, really, really significant. And um, both for the student traction and also for the teacher traction and um, providing opportunities for them as well. Um, and that's great and it's really exciting and we think you know it, it's it's great for our portfolio and the equity value but even more i think what we think it reflects is a is a acceleration of, of behavior change that's been a long time coming and a different level of comfort i mean you can look at that kind of growth and see two things and, and this is a real debate no one knows the answer is it short-term COVID growth or is it long-term systemic behavior change right and People can take both sides of it. Um, it's easy to look at things that were alternatives to traditional schooling and say they had massive benefit from a time where all these schools were closed and the economy was shut down. Now schools are going to reopen. You're going to retreat to kind of the status quo before. What we're saying is we don't think that this, you know, the slope of the curve is going to remain the same. We don't think this kind of growth curve continues indefinitely, but we think it's created a new uh, baseline for learning. And part of that baseline is how we think about education and parents saying, rather than just, I'm going to go with the default, I can think creatively about what education means for our family, different options, different mm -hmm. puzzle pieces put together. I've now done that. I've done it because I had to do it, but I've learned that I can. And I've seen both what didn't work and what was hard, but also some things that really did work for my child. And I'm going to keep doing that. And that has been something that this category has been waiting for for a long time. And we all wish it came in a way that wasn't a pandemic, but um, there should be big opportunity out of that. Yeah, I, I think you say something so interesting, which is that idea of agency, you know, that I actually like I have the ability to do something about a system yeah. that hasn't changed for 50 years versus um, just kind of take what I've been doing forever. And it's like necessity right. is the mother of all invention, you know, um, yeah. just a personal anecdote. Um, I, I, I think you know this, but I, I, I you may not. So um, I've chatted so many times with Albert, who's also super interested in education. Yeah. And um, it was actually many years ago, like four years ago, that I went to his house in New York. And he, he has a really interesting personal way he's educating his kids. He's homeschooling them, passion driven. And um, I came back and sat in my grade two son's, you know, class and was just dismally disappointed uh, by, you know, a very institutional system. Uh, and it led me to creating this very, very micro, small, passion-based learning curriculum for like kids in my neighborhood and a couple, mm -hmm. and it was really for all ages. And what's been so fascinating is the timing is everything. Because a system like that, like a school like that, is super hard to scale in person. Well, um, now there are but lots of scaling. It, well, that's the point, you know, is now yeah. like the Soras of the world and, you know, yeah. our little or school get curious Brenda. now. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's possible in a different, in a different context. And, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm really yeah. curious. Yeah, um, I'm really curious for you when you think about um, uh, an out school, for example, and you think about the, the accessibility side of it, you know, one of the things is the course, the classes add up, right? Like it's not exactly, it's not cheap, especially if your alternative is public. How do you think about monetizing school and sort of the, the, outcomes-based agenda versus the VC investor agenda around yeah. you know, mon monetization. That would be really interesting. Well, I think a couple of things here. First of all, a platform like OutSchool is really designed around supplemental learning. They have a core, they have one core customer base that are generally homeschoolers. Um, mm -hmm. If you take their customer base, you split them into two. One is what we call traditional schoolers, which just means you go to any school, you're not homeschooled, right? And for them, um, much of this is supplemental learning. And so the alternative is, is not free public school. It's either 
private tutoring, local offline kind of, you know, supplemental classes, mm -hmm. not doing it at all. And so not being able to access this kind of thing. And so it's still a cost trade off, but it's a little bit of a different cost trade off. Um, there are other programs like Asora, right, where mm -hmm. families are paying for school where otherwise they may not be. They'd be going to private school. And this is something we've thought a lot about. Right now, basically, in America, schooling works in if you take out parochial school and the religious schools, right, that's kind of its own bucket. But if you take that out, sure. school works in basically two ways. Public school, which is free. And it's not totally free because there's costs associated with it that you have to bucket sure. in and things like that. But let's put it as kind of free or private school, which is often wildly expensive, right? And so one thing we've thought a lot about is will families and mass market families, you know, the M America families, not top 1% coastal families, be mm -hmm. um, willing to, to allocate an amount of capital that is neither zero nor private school tuition towards education to give them a third bucket and a third option when private school is either not appealing or inaccessible, but public school isn't working for their kids. And that's really what SOAR is saying. Um, mm -hmm. You know, SOAR is, call it $5,000 a family a year. And so it's, it's not free, like that's a real amount of money, but it's not Forty thousand dollars a year, right. um, where and so that's one bet. Is there kind of a third option um, for families? But I think part of that is the belief that over time you drive it down, and this is the idea yeah. of changing the system from the outside in. Over time, there's a very high probability, and some programs have shown this that you'll be able to get these kind of programs covered through charters and public schools. Right, that state mm -hmm. budgets will pay for them as options. But the only way to do that is to show the demand from the students. And so part of totally. this strategy is to back run to that. And there are companies that are doing that more directly. You know, when you were talking about the kind of micro school you built in your neighborhood several years ago, there's a company called Prenda. We're, we're not current investors in it, but it's one we admire. And they're scaling a, a micro school strategy oh, really? in person schools throughout the country, but they've started in um, Arizona and Colorado, um, and they're they're licensed as digital. Um, we're not investors, so I, I might get this wrong, but it's something like digital charter schools. But anyway, it's free for the students. It counts mm -hmm. as part of public school, even the modality so cool. is different as a venture back company. So I think the the whole category mm -hmm. requires like a bit of creative thinking to it, and and kind of weaving through this as it goes. I love that. So I'm, I'm actually really interested in um, what are your thoughts on creator led schools? So, for example, you know, David Perel is a get was a guest on our show. He runs the most phenomenal writing school. He does two cohorts, 50 people, live synchronous learning experiences. Do you think that's going to be a big theme or trend in the future that people like the Seth Godin, Shane Parrish, David Perel's, you know, and, and also the long tail of creators are going to want to have their own, you know, virtual schools. Yeah, and, and that is kind of a totally different section of learning. Right now we're in kind of lifelong learning. And that's one that really excites sure. us. We've we've done several things in it, both vertical based like a Duolingo and also or a code academy, um, and more mm -hmm. horizontal based like a Skillshare. Um, and so I'm a big believer that instead of looking at learning in these kind of designated um, certificate driven buckets in our lives, we're going to learn, look at it as much more horizontal and ongoing that when things pique our curiosity, um, we can learn about them and we can learn about them through experts, um, through people like that you mentioned that have real expertise and spaces and make that accessible. The question we think about is how does that relate to to venture scale companies? And is that gonna result in platforms like Skillshare where that talent aggregates and there's kind of horizontal marketplaces where you can find it or more tool sets like Teachable that give these people tools and platforms to build their own brands um, individually? And the answer is likely some of both. Um, but yes, I think that will kind of continue to happen in big ways. Yeah, no, I, I'm a big believer in 
platforms that are going to help creators. And I, I think, you know, your, your point is really well taken. And so that brings me to your prediction for higher ed. So I know, you know, you went to Harvard, you went to Stanford. What do you think happens to higher ed? Yeah, you know, whenever I talk about this category, I always do like to say, like, I am a complete, you know, product of a benefit of a branded system. And, and um, we can, you know, as as much of our team at USV who has this thesis. And so um, we have to be self-aware about that. Um, and in some ways, higher ed is, I think, the most broken and also the most hard to tackle and fix um, in mm -hmm. that it's the most effective. It creates the most debt. Um, and it's the most brand oriented, where um, it's the hardest we think to intermediate because the value customers place on the individual brands is so high. So our bet has been, we have not done anything in higher ed so far. Um, it has mm -hmm. not been the category that we've thought has the lowest hanging fruit to kind of catapult the system, if that makes sense, when you think about a direct mm -hmm. learner model. Um, we've talked a lot about it, and I do think increasingly as students want to learn online, you know, things like um, Code Academy or Lambda are probably the things that are the most threatening to higher ed that allow students um, who are more, who want to go the vocational route, but in a kind of very high quality way to potentially skip that step and get training that goes straight to the workforce in, in roles that they admire and, and look for. Um, we also talk about the role of online schooling and that if you think about what could pull people away from higher ed institutions, um, what about star instructors that they really admire and platforms that can give those star instructors what they want, which is reach, money, um, time to do research and other things, all of those things that are so appealing about the kind of institutional higher ed. You could imagine a world where they could get that elsewhere, but I, I think that's really still being baked. Yeah, I, I think you make a really good point that it's it's the stickiest, um, it's it's the hardest to sort of crack for sure. And I'm I'm curious when you think about um, some of these new models for higher ed, like ISAs, for example, like a Lambda school, is that here to stay? Like, do you see performance based education as a as an end or just a means to you know trying to fix the the old system? I think it will be an option. We've always been believers that ISAs are a financial tool versus a business in and of itself. So they may have a role in platforms and a way for certain students to finance education that's a good one for them. It's probably not a good one for everyone. You know, right now, ISAs are not super regulated. My bet, and I have no, this is a hypothesis, it's not a based mm -hmm. claim. My bet is sooner or later they'll be regulated as lenders. Um, because in effect they are lending and so mm -hmm. and they're not regular lenders right now and once that happens that will change the economics of them and kind of how they work and so I think there's still a story being written but I but again I think even as the tool set evolves there'll be a role for them I just think you'll need a lot of options so that it's not a one-size-fits-all model that's in general, in education, I, I think that's my main thesis. It, it cannot be a one fits all. <laughs> There's lots. Um, I, I think, but I think that's really, we're all human. There's so many different humans in the world. You know, how right. can it be? It's sort of your, your point. Um, what, one thing I'm, I'm really curious on is you said it's not where you see the lowest hanging fruit in terms of this, this next, uh, you know, explosion of innovation. What are those areas? that you see more low hanging fruit um, for entrepreneurs uh, to be tackling right now? What are some of the pain points that you think are like really specific to be solved? I don't know if these are the lowest hanging fruit. I, I guess they're the ones that we're, we are really interested in or, or spending a lot of time in. Um, definitely there's a lot in that lifelong learning category, people wanting to engage and learn throughout their lives and what that means and how they'll find that accessible. Um, especially productized learning, that Duolingo-like model that really can drive down cost and create accessibility to learning in new ways. That's definitely one. I think another is social learning. 
um, how learning online can be social. And we've seen a bunch of stuff there and that continues to interest us. We know people want to engage and belong in online communities. We know people want to learn together. We know that one of the biggest learning you know, platforms right now is TikTok, right? Like, and that's interesting to us, right? That there's this intersection of social learning and does that just get more and more integrated into one or actually are there learnings there that breaks it out into its own platform and how does that look and so we've been spending a fair amount of time engaged with that category can you for the people who are not as familiar with the learning that's happening on TikTok, what's happening there what what are you witnessing or yeah, are you exploring I mean, well, for one, so TikTok, you know, which spun out of ByteDance in China, originally really started as a learning and education platform before it went deeper into a social platform. And so what you're seeing is stars rise up that teach things in fun and entertaining ways, right? And we think a lot about um, constraints that breed creativity. And that's one. If you have to, you know, um, mold your format to a TikTok format that's going to get great engagement, but you have to teach something in that what do you do? That's a cool constraint. Because what you find is that people are figuring out if you go on TikTok and search, you know, a question about science or math, you'll see these amazing creative videos that are teaching these core, you know, topics in really fun and interesting ways. And they're not the only one. There's learning specific platforms doing that as well, like Mystery Science and others. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's really interesting to think about, you know, does that train a behavior around learning and what's the opportunity there. You know, I think there's another one around how do you learn together and how do you make learning interactive and low stress for students and fun. There's a very early stage social learning company called Fiveable, started by this amazing woman who was a teacher and just realized like her kids were getting stuck when she just live streamed herself talking to them really casually and kind of laying it out they totally got it and they relaxed and they absorbed the information and she's trying to kind of scale that idea as a platform with teachers and it's really cool um so i think all of those things are, are really interesting to us right now yeah i i think the, the meta theme that you're bringing up that's so interesting is just like learning is entertainment you know and this mm -hmm. idea of passion you know, and, and I, I thought, you know, I didn't give you much time to talk about Sora schools. And it's so interesting. I listened to your recent podcast um, on it. And maybe you can sort of talk a little bit more about just that role of passion and inspiration and motivation versus, you know, what we're currently used to as to, you know, what Sora is doing there. Because it sounds like a high school yeah, I would know. like. <laughs> so Sora is, yeah, exactly. I think one of the things that really resonated to us about Sora, and again, it's extremely early, but is that the more people we talked to about her was like, oh, I wish I could have gone to that high school. And we're like, well, that's interesting, right? Like that's saying something. And the idea is that allowing students to follow their passion helps them learn more and better. And doing that mm -hmm. in a way that allows them to learn everything. We're not, we aren't saying, you know, students super interesting in computer science shouldn't have to, you know, learn the humanities. But they should be allowed, or if they would like to, if the families would like to, there should be an avenue for them to be allowed to, to pull on the threads that interest them and do it in a kind of project apply driven way and be supported in that and also be taught humanities in a way that fits into that broader picture. But in order to do that, everyone's learning journey would look different. When you're in a school mm -hmm. that structures everyone in classes that look the same, you can't do that. You can't let those right. threads be pulled. So you'd have to change the system. And that's really what Sora is trying to do. Build this kind of flexible online platform that cohorts students so there's a sense of community, but allows each of them to develop their own learning journey where they really pull the threads on what's interesting. And when you dive into what even in the very early days is happening there, it's, it's amazing. You have students, you know, building things and learning about things and deciding they're interesting in something and really learning what that means. And something that excites us about that is that's something you're gonna do through your whole life, right? Like that's right. you know, long after kind of structured schooling is done, the ability and the know-how of how to develop a curiosity and go after it is a core life skill. And so we think that gives students kind of a leg up. Um, so that's part of what interested us there. 
Yeah, it's super interesting. I'm, I'm really excited uh, about what they're doing, which is great. So we're getting close to the time where I'm going to uh, open this up for questions. And just a okay. reminder to everybody on the call, please ask questions. We've got a bunch of really good ones here. Um, but before we do that, I want to actually sort of bring this full circle back to this week and this election. <laughs> and, you know, really, um, just, I think, you know, especially in, as a Canadian, right, who's sitting like in a different place uh, and a different construct around education. Talk to me about, you know, your highest hope in the next like five years. Like what does education, what happens in the country around education? What do you, what's the your highest dream for where we want to go? Look, I think our highest dream, and I think five years is probably realistically too short of a of a timetable to expect it in, is there's a um, flexibility and personalization that technology can provide that's integrated into what education means. And so you allow technology to impact a, a currently overall one-size-fits-all system and introduce the flexibility that creates better outcomes, more joy, more accessibility, um, higher quality to a farther reaching group of people um, in new ways through a whole host of different products and platforms. That's gonna take time. It's really hard to change an old structured system, but I think we're starting to see the beginnings of that happen. For sure. Thank you. I, I, I'm super inspired by that. So let's um, let's get into the last question, which I know lots of entrepreneurs and, and people who are in the tech ecosystem in Toronto are listening. Um, what do you look for, you know, from entrepreneurs who are, you know, building learning platforms? Like, how do you how do you evaluate who you're investing in right now? What what are the, the key things you're looking for? Sure. I mean, I'd answer that in two ways. One is specific to learning and one's just general for, for us overall. You know, specific to learning, this is a category we're actually relatively narrow and we touched on some already. Um, there's going to be a lot of businesses built in learning and many of them will hopefully be great. Only some of them are a fit for us. We are looking for things that are direct to learners who are not going through channels um, mm -hmm. that fundamentally provide accessibility and broaden access. So there's an opportunity in them to drive down cost and to um, expand access, make something available to more people that was previously available to fewer. Um, and we particularly are looking for something that has an underlying network effect to it, uh, where mm -hmm. there's a bottom up mechanism. So um, if you're building a learning platform that kind of hits on those, it's much more likely to be a fit for us than some of the other ones there. The more general answer is, you know, we're specifically focused on kind of seed and series A. Um, generally, once there's a product built, um, usually with some, you know, even the beginning amount of, of consumer trial interaction so we can understand kind of how it works in the wild. Um, and then opportunistically, we'll go later as well. We have an opportunity fund, so we'll do things later. But kind of seed and series A are, are the core of our business. And we look for entrepreneurs that are, you know, wildly passionate that are excellent storytellers because we believe you're going to have to tell this story in in a convincing way to lots of constituents over the course of a company's life um, that are you know talent magnets and very focused on recruiting great teams around them um, we tend to gravitate towards very product driven founders mm -hmm. you know, for me in early days it's as much about you know probably more so about the people building than about the ideas and the, and the theme that they're building around so great. Well, as, as somebody who's been a part of your portfolio uh, from Wattpad, I, I only have amazing things to say about um, you. you guys. So that's great. So we have some amazing questions. Um, so I'm going to head right there. Uh, Tatiana Feldman, Rebecca, I'd love to know if you guys think about starting the journey even earlier in that zero to five stage or direct to parent segment. Are you thinking about, you know, sore style journeys in early childhood and um, what are you seeing? Yeah, so um, we've spent a bunch of time in this category. I, I have a two year old and an another one on the way. So it's definitely relevant to Congrats. me. And, and I think about, thank you. Um, the thing that we've str struggled a little bit with here is probably two things and, and people who feel like they're cracking the code, we always wanna hear. The reality is in those days, much of it is about childcare. 
And much of that needs to be a physical presence. And so many of those models hinge on physical um, businesses and, and physical locations. And, and as a very technology centric network based firm, many of those are not a fit for us. So we've we've been mm -hmm. we haven't yet found the intersection of that category with us since uh, since that's very child care based. Um, the other answer is the the willingness to pay their parents and we really do want something that broadens access and so what the cost dynamics are in that category we're still cracking but interested in seeing things that that may push our thinking on that S super helpful um thank you so um Rika asked um can you talk a little bit more about productizing learnings so, or productizing learning. So I think more in the Duolingo, you know, comment that you made, what, yeah. what do you mean by that? Can you explain? Sure, yeah, and we've done several things in this category. One is Duolingo, another one, I'm not 100% sure it's announced, so I, I won't say it, but it's around a similar idea in math and science. Um, the idea is that when, when learning can be done through technology product or platform versus through human to human interaction, you can, affect cost in a totally different way. And we sure. never think that's going to be 100% of a learning journey, right? Like humans have a big interaction in that. But are there pieces, and, and Duolingo is probably the one we have the most experience in, where it is an effective way to learn a language, and it is not human to human, right? The product you're learning from on Duolingo is mm -hmm. technology, um, it's product and AI. And so, um, are there, you know, when that can be applied, you can give it for free. You can give it very low cost in a way that you never can where you're paying someone else on the other side. And so we're curious where that can apply. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, so Agustina asks, um, my question is um, more around the decision process. I think you answered a lot of this, but I'll just ask, you know, one sure. slight version of it, which is, you know, how you select ed tech firms, but specifically around metrics, you know, are there specific metrics you're looking for, you know, at seed and at series A so that, um, you know, entrepreneurs on the call could could better be positioned? Yeah, I, I, I always completely understand why this question is asked. And I always feel a little bit bad giving an un, unsatisfying answer because the answer is, is no, there aren't, we don't have series A benchmark metrics where when companies hit, you know, X, dollars of revenue right. or X rate, you know, it's a fit for us, though. Well, trust me, we all wish we did. It would be easier on all sides. What I would say is particularly in learning, the, the category that matters most to us is engagement. That we believe mm -hmm. that if, if particularly in direct to learning, direct to learner models, if you can show that learners love what you're building, that they're engaging with it, that they're coming back, that their rate of engagement is increasing over time, we are comfortable making the bet that you will find more of those learners. Um, so that's probably the area of metrics we dig in on the most when looking at these businesses. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. Um, great. Uh, so Ron Nakagawa uh, said, great question. He asked, what role should government play in changing and transforming education? Um, how do you see the role of you know, government moving forward? Yeah, look, I think government has a giant role in education. Education is incredible because it's much of it is free. And um, that's an amazing thing. And, and um, you know, I think this is a sphere, some of the meatiest and most interesting spheres right now are also the hardest where regulation and government and technology and innovation really have to work hand in hand and have to play off of each other. And that's not something that has a ton of history and happening and so it's hard, but we think it's possible. But part of this thesis around going direct to learner is we think it's gonna be easier when you do it from the outside in. That going through the government entities, through the regulated districts right away is just harder. Whereas if you can prove the demand and the effects, the outcomes, um, it's going to be easier to change systems like government. Government's a very powerful force, but we also know it's, it's a slow one. It's it's challenging to change. It's the definition of bureaucracy. Um, and, you know, we're, we're seeing that in action literally as we speak. Um, and so I'm optimistic that, you know, and, and government here is also really complicated. Um, there's mm -hmm. a lot of differences in them state to state. There's a lot of union entities. There's just a lot there. And so um, we think over time that has to work hand in hand, but you're going to jumpstart it by going direct to learner. 
Awesome. So I, there's a, you know, one or two more questions and then I will let everybody go by just before the hour. Cause I know it's Friday afternoon after the most intense, intense week. Um, one more question is really around the role of globalization and the impact of people being able to learn from anywhere. Um, what, what are your thoughts on how globalization is going to impact society and, and learning? Yeah, this is something we're actually particularly interested in. And I think it's one of those categories is actually still quite nascent. Education has been very siloed, right? In a world mm -hmm. that's become increasingly global, where people are moving around increasingly more, where, you know, people feel less tied to, to where they live. And this idea of kind of um, citizens of the world is, you know, becoming more and more popular outside of COVID times. Um, you know, education is still very localized and largely it's because most of it's been defined as in-person learning, right? Where if you have to show up every day at a public school in your town, there's a constraint on what that means. When you start losing some of those constraints, you create a lot of opportunity. It has complexity, right? If you believe some learning is going to be synchronous, there's time zone issues, there's language issues, there's all kinds of things. But we believe all of those constraints are also opportunity to have people learn from people totally different than themselves or, you know, be able to access new ideas in different ways. Um, in Sora in particular, it sees a lot of interest globally. And we think that will be really cool, um, really interesting for those students to be able to learn together. But there's logistics to figure out to it. So we're quite interested in how, lo how learning becomes global. But um, I think that's one where it's still quite early days. Awesome. Super interesting. And the last one is really, you know, there's a saying strong opinions loosely held. What is, you know, what are three strong opinions you have? You can loosely hold them about education that you haven't shared yet with us uh, today. Ooh. Man, um, all of our opinions are loosely held and will change, you know, very quickly over time. Um, what are, I mean, I think we've, we've talked about the biggest ones. I think, you know, the share shift that learning becomes less of a homogeneous journey and more of a um, heterogeneous one that combines different products and platforms put together, that um, families, there is um, a willingness to pay for education or pieces of education in, in a different kind of way than there used to be in a more creative thinking around what that means. Um, I think one we haven't talked about is that, um, the role of teachers and the role of practitioners might go hand in hand at a much earlier age. We think about that a lot in kind of graduate level learning or top university level learning, but you know, Sora and others are experimenting with that through much earlier education and seeing powerful results. And so that's something that's interesting to us as well. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. Um, and we didn't touch on that around internships and just the idea of learning by doing, you know, yeah. um, for sure. Well, I mean, I could spend a lot longer and so could the community, um, but I, I'll stop the questions for now and just say a huge thank you for joining us after a very intense long week. Um, you're, you're doing amazing stuff. You're investing in making the world truly better based on the, the education investments and learning investments that you're doing. So, you know, most of our community here is in Toronto or in Canada. So we're, we're big fans. Um, and obviously, um, thank you for spending time on a Friday afternoon with us. Um, I'm, before I say goodbye, lots of people to thank uh, Either Live, who's our production partner. Again, thank you for helping us. And we have amazing live stream partners who all share um, our live stream, uh, Toronto Life Insider, York University, General Assembly, the Knowledge Society, Getting Smart, TechTO, Rotman, CIX, and Delhi North. Lots of people will see this. So thank you to our amazing partners. And we have had so much fun bringing you this live learning series. Uh, it's informing so much of what we're building at Mastermind and also how Mastermind can be of service to so many of these pain points. And uh, we have one last episode. We're super excited to announce that Ryan Holiday, who's amazing, he's an author, he wrote The Daily Stoic, he just came out with a new book, The Lives of the Stoic, and he now has a live learning experience, is our last guest on the series. And that will be happening on Monday. No, sorry, 
it will not be happening on Monday. It is happening on Friday next week. Uh, so everybody, a well-deserved weekend. And let's uh, hope we continue with optimism uh, around where things are headed. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Really appreciate Thank you for having you. Here. See you soon. Awesome. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye.